take out our lesson sheet for tonight. And we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25. And last week we um, kind of jumped into chapter 24. And of course, as we look at the chronological record of the life of Jesus, this is his last week on earth. And, uh, and so he's uh, preparing his disciples uh, for something that um, they, of course, were not expecting and were not desirous of, and that is, of course, the work of the cross. And they didn't understand all of that, and so Jesus is kind of preparing them for that. But he's also preparing them for the reality of what is going to happen after that and how are they, they are to continue on um, as disciples of Christ and with the great responsibility of telling others about Jesus and who he is and why he came to earth and uh, in his, his uh, life as uh, not only a, a good man, if you will, or a great teacher, great rabbi, but a great God. And, uh, and that is certainly the, the reality of that. And so, uh, so we're going to look at chapter 25 now of Matthew. Now, last week, we uh, again noted the fact that in Luke, Luke's account, Luke chapter 22, of course, uh, is where we were studying last week. But that's parallel here to Matthew chapter 24 and 25, which is all known as the Olivet Discourse. Now, Matthew gives the greatest details of those different things. And so uh, tonight we're going to be looking, this is our last message on the parables. Pondering the parables will be ended next week. We're not going to finish it tonight, okay? We're not going to finish it tonight because there are three parables that we're going to be looking at over the next uh, two Wednesday nights. But, um, but as we look at this, um, uh, again, some, some do not consider these as parables. Um, and, uh, and the reason is because it doesn't actually say parable, you know, uh, it just refers to the kingdom of heaven. Um, and so, but whether these are similes, if you will, you know, metaphors, teaching about what the kingdom of heaven is like, uh, or they're actually parabolic in their, their form. Certainly the, the nature of them seem very parabolic. And so I consider them as parables. And so since I do, you must as well. Just kidding. But, um, but we'll be looking at uh, three of these parables here tonight, uh, or tonight and uh, next Wednesday night as we wrap up the parables of the Lord. So in order for us to really understand chapter 25, we've got to go back to the beginning of chapter 24. Jesus teaches them of what is to come, and he starts off in verse number 1 where Matthew records for us, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left one or here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And then Jesus answered and said unto them, and he gives them the, the truths that will uh, will unfold, and then he just goes through some other uh, elements of what's going to happen for the children of Israel, uh, known as, of course, the tribulation, and all these things that will come to pass prior to his, his return. And then you come to chapter 25, and then he continues on, and he says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, 
But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know ye not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. And so as we look at the parable here tonight, or starting here tonight, uh, we're, we're going to kind of jump into where we left off last week, if you will, in, in our study, especially of the, the, the fig tree, um, right, trying to figure it, it out. Uh, a lot of people are trying to figure out the Lord's return, when is he coming, all the date setters and everything. And, uh, and it continues in chapter 25. People will take kind of uh, these elements as well. But let's just kind of look at what Jesus teaches us concerning these parables. First of all, Jesus here resumes his revelation of the chronology of the future concerning his judgment on Israel and Gentiles. And that's why I've titled this lesson tonight, Faithful Judgment. There's not a judgment that Jesus will ever pass on people that is not faithful. He knows exactly what is true. He knows exactly what is right. And the parables that we're going to be looking at over these next two nights is exactly that. They're faithful judgments. Jesus knows everything. Right, and, and we learn that even from, from these parables as well as so many other things. And so he's going to teach us a little bit about the, 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 what, what's going to happen with, with the, 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 the nation of Israel as well as the Gentile people and how uh, people respond uh, to that. Notice what he says here in verse number one. He says, then, again, future Right. This is one day that's going to happen again. The question that spurred all this on was, what are the signs? Right. How how do we know when you're coming back or how do we know when uh, not when you're coming back? Because they didn't know that he was going away. But but when is the end of all these things going to happen? Right. And so uh, so he's uh, kind of encouraging them on this. He's uh, teaching them and instructing them concerning this. And he gives to them these incredible uh, parables. And so there's three parables that are given in this chapter. First of all, the parable of the ten virgins. Again, here in verse number 1 down through verse number 13. And then secondly, the parable of the talents. The parable of the talents. And we'll be looking at that uh, in verses 14 uh, down uh, through verse number 30. And then the, the third uh, parable that we'll be looking at are the parable of the sheep and goats. The parable of the sheep and goats, verses 31 through the end of the chapter. And so as we look at these, uh, really what these three parables are going to point out are those who are truly saved. Those who are truly saved. Remember, Go back to chapter 24 real quickly. In verse number um, 3, it says, As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. So this is not a large body of people that Jesus is preaching to. He's not teaching. He's not instructing. He's not evangelizing. Right? He's speaking privately to his disciples. Now, whether that's the the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles, or whether that's a few other disciples, I can imagine there being some ladies there present with him, right? And so he's gathered around these disciples and he begins to teach them. And he teaches them about the end of the times, if you will. And in that, he gives them these parables. And uh, so tonight we're going to be looking uh, specifically at the parable of the 10 virgins. Now, what do we learn from the parable of the 10 virgins? We learn from these, uh, this parable an adequate preparation. Adequate preparation. And uh, we, we see that really in verse 13. Right? Look at verse 13 again. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Right? So what? Watch. Be adequately prepared. 
None of us know when he's coming back. You know, again, Jesus, Jesus, teach us. When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? How are we going to know this? And Jesus says, just be what? Adequately prepared. Just be ready. Watch, therefore. Be on guard. Be ready. None of us know the hour. And of course, we all recognize the importance of that. Right? We all recognize the fact that we all need to be adequately prepared. Right, if, if you and I knew that Jesus Christ was going to come back on January the 20, let's say, 1st, 2025, we know that, okay, we have a little over a month before he comes back. And man, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do in the next 40 plus days. I'm going to spend all my money, or I'm going I'm to rack up the credit card debt, right? That's what I'm going to do, right? I'm going to Hawaii. I'm going, I don't know where else I want to go. I don't know why I always want to go to Hawaii. I don't think I want to go to Hawaii. I think I want to go to the Caribbean, maybe, uh, you know, someplace like that. You know, I'm going to do that. I am going to buy, if I could use my uh, credit card to buy my Lamborghini, I'm buying my Lamborghini, Right? We're, we're going to be doing all different kinds of things. And we're going to go visit all kinds of places. Maybe some would say, well, you know what? I kind of need to make some things right with some people. You know, ah, forget it. I don't care about them. You know, uh, but I'll, I'll do this. And then especially what? I know he's coming back. So January the, did I say the 20th? That he's coming back? 21st. Okay. So January the 20th, I will make sure that I get everything squared away. I will make sure that my heart is right with God. I will make sure all this, I will pray through the night really is what I'm going to do, right? Just to make sure. And, and what? And Jesus says, that's not how I want you to live. I want you to live like I'm coming back at any moment. It could be tonight, right? And, and so, so Jesus gives them this parable of the 10 virgins. Now there's several parables that Jesus gives us regarding weddings, Right? That, that's kind of one of the familiar things. And, and we, we can identify with that, right? I mean, weddings are, are pretty significant events, right? And so Jesus gives us another parable regarding a wedding, right? Jewish weddings are, are uh, important. And so here's what Jesus says here. So notice what Jesus says regarding this. He talks about these ten virgins, which uh, verse number one took their lamps, went forth to meet, notice, the bridegroom. Okay? So we know this is about a wedding, right? And, and a Jewish wedding has significant things, elements about the Jewish wedding or about the wedding event itself. You have the, the bride and you have the bridegroom. And there is always, it starts at the bride's parents' home and then it processes, if you will, to the bridegroom's parents' home. And wherever they're going to eventually live. Sometimes, of course, they live at, at one of those parents' homes. Most likely the bridegroom's parents' home. We don't practice that in our culture today. I kind of like it because I've got two boys and only one daughter. So I want both boys and their wives and all their kids living with me. I'll take my daughter too. But, uh, you know, she, she won't... Uh, she won't want to. So anyway, um, you know, so, you know, th this is kind of what's going on. And so uh, along the way or along the procession, you would have these servant girls. They're referred to in here as virgins, right? Because that is the hope, if you will. And, and I, I don't want to get too much into teaching and, and maybe making it say something that it's not intending to say. But that's your hope of the, of the bride is to be a virgin. And so these young ladies that are processing with the, the bride should be in that purity or state of purity. You know, Jesus isn't teaching about purity here. That's, that's my point. He's not teaching about purity. But we could see that. And he uses this term virgins because they were typically the ones who were to go around and they would lead the way with their torches, their lights. That's what he's going to speak about here. And so he says, what did they do in verse number one? They took their lamps, they went forth to meet the bridegroom. So here's this procession that is going on. And then he tells us a little bit about them. Verse number two, five of them were wise, five of them were foolish. Why would you call them wise and foolish? Verse number three, they that took their 
or they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. That's why they're foolish. Why would you take your oil lamps and not take oil with you? Right? The wise, in verse number four, took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Remember, I've said before in our previous parables that the weddings, right, they, they would announce it. They, they would set a date, but like the, the meal, the feast that they would celebrate, wouldn't be announced until the, the, an hour before, right? Okay, now go to the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. Why? Because the other people were occupied and making excuses with other things. Well, here's, here's all of a sudden these, these five wise virgins that are what? They, they have their oil with them. And these five foolish virgins, they don't have their oil with them. Not a good idea. Right? That's what Jesus is saying. So, so what do we learn from uh, these different uh, elements here concerning the, the parable itself? Well, of course, the bridegroom would refer to Christ himself. The virgins would be those who are all professing believers. They would all be professing believers, right? They're all virgins, but the point is what? Again, faithful judgment, right? Not all ten are saved. They profess. And of course, you and I can simply think about a lot of people that you've known of throughout your years of, of life in Christianity, of people who, are, who have made a profession, but there's really no true possession. And this is what Jesus is going to point out here, right? And, and so as we look at this, we, we know what's, what's going on. The lamps, of course, would represent their lives. Uh, the oil that is uh, used here would speak of their righteousness, or later on, we would understand the Holy Spirit is the symbol, or oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And of course, as New Testament believers, we know that Jesus, uh, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, then indwells the true believer. So, what does Jesus do? He gives us this dramatic picture of this procession where you have five wise virgins and five unwise, or if you will, foolish virgins. Virgin. So what is he pointing out? The first thing that we see here is that the wise virgins were making adequate preparation for what they knew they would need. That is what? We need the Holy Spirit. We need oil. So we're going to carry it around with us. We don't know when the bridegroom is going to show up. You know, he's out playing basketball. He's out fishing. He's out uh, cruising around. We don't know what's going on, but, but we're going to always be ready. Right? And it's the same thing for the believer in Jesus Christ. We don't know when the bridegroom's coming. We don't know when Jesus is going to be returning. But what? We have made adequate preparation. We have prepared ourselves well and wisely for his return when he does return. Right? And that is, as Christians, how we ought to live our lives. And so there's some things that Jesus teaches us about these Things. First of all, the ten virgins do certainly have a reflection, if you will, of their lives or of their, their testimonies. Right? And, uh, you know, known as foolish versus wise. You know, how do people recognize us? How do people look at us as believers in Christ? Do they, or, or professing Christians, do they look at us and say, boy, you know, and I'm not talking about the, the cynics or, or anything of that nature, you know, those who, who mock Christianity. He, he's not talking about that. He's not addressing the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's talking to who? His disciples. And he's saying to his disciples, hey, I just want you to understand when, when I return, who are truly my people? Because there's some professing people out there, Right? Remember, if these are just the 12 or the 12 plus a few others, we know that there's one of them that is a professing follower of Christ, right? And his name is who or what? What's his name? Judas, right? 
We know that, right? So, so Judas, you, you would never look at Judas and think he wasn't a true follower of Jesus. You wouldn't have. No one would have caught that. Right? I mean, this is, this is, this is one of Jesus' close uh, friends. He's, he's one who's been following him for years now. And, and uh, you know, he's, he's now given the money sack. He's the treasurer. You don't just give that to anybody. Not, certainly not Matthew. <laughs> Right? And, and, and what? Hey, here, nobody knew this until all of a sudden later this week, Jesus is sitting in that upper room and he says, and one of you, one of you is not really of us. And nobody would have guessed that it was that. And so, so, so we, we see this. Second thing that we also see here is that the foolish virgins do what? They take no oil except what they already have in their lamps. And so what, what? Well, when it runs out, you have nothing, right? There, there's no true, if you will, righteousness in them. They just have enough for the moment. The wise virgins certainly take oil. They don't just depend on what they already have. They have more. They add to what they eventually will run out of. And so, so we, we can learn uh, from this that, that Christ is teaching the disciples that, hey, if you're one of these wise virgins and you are adequately prepared, you know what is needed and how you need to uh, truly prepare uh, for this. Uh, and so what happens? So here's uh, verse number four uh, or, or verse number five. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. All right? There, there's, there's a difference between slumbering and sleeping. Okay? Slumbering means you're getting tired. And, and, and here's the reality. How many Christians get tired? You know, we get tired. Sometimes we get tired of even, you know, just, Lord, what's going on? God, just, just please return. Please come back. I'm so tired. You know, Paul would remind us of that too, right? Be not weary in well-doing, right? You can't get weary, right? And, and, and so all 10 of them slumber and even all 10 sleep. Right? They, they all go to bed. And, and, and so here's the picture. So here, all of a sudden, the bridegroom, he's tearing. He's out. He's, he's not, he has not yet returned yet. Right? He's, he's gone away. You know, other parables, he's gone on a long journey. Right? If you will. And of course, you and I, we now understand that that's where Jesus is right now. The bridegroom is gone. He's in heaven right now. One day he's coming back. We don't know when he's coming back. But when he does come back, will we be adequately prepared? Right? And the wise ones are what? Those who are adequately prepared. They have oil not only in their lamps already, but what? They're carrying it with them. Right? And, and so he goes on in verse number six. At midnight there was a cry made. Behold! Hey, everyone, the bridegroom comes. Have you ever wondered why at midnight? <laughs> right? Oh, come on! I just got to sleep. Right? How about 6 a.m.? How about 10 a.m.? Right? Not at midnight, but what? None of us get to call when Jesus can return. And so what? The, behold, the bridegroom cometh, so go ye out to meet him. Verse 7, then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps or made ready their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Have you ever sang the song, Give Me Oil? Right? You guys know that song? I just lost it. How does it go? No. Yeah. Give me oil in my lamp. Keep me burning, burning, burning. Give me oil in my lamp. And then I, I love, you know, give me gas for my Ford. <laughs> Keep me trucking for the Lord. No, we... Right, but uh, so, so so here here they are. They say, "Hey, hey, 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 ladies, listen. We don't have any oil. We didn't adequately prepare. Can we have your oil? Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out." But the wise answered, saying, 
Not so. You know, why? Because then they wouldn't have oil for their lamps. Right? And, and what a great lesson we learn from this as well. Spiritually speaking, right? I can't be the Holy Spirit in someone's life. Now, here's the sad thing. Sometimes we as Christians try to play the Holy Spirit. Right? And we do a very poor job at it. Right? We do a very poor job at it. I, I can, sad to say, I can make people feel guilty. Right? I can make them feel guilty. I can make them feel bad and feel like, oh, man, I'm just such a horrible Christian and I'm not even sure that I'm saved. You know, sometimes there are preachers that can do that, right? I mean, I don't know. There's one preacher that, man, he'll make you doubt uh, your salvation up and down. And, uh, you know, you need to come to the altar fi- uh, 5,000 times and maybe, maybe you'll finally get it right. And, you know, and they're, they're, they're really good at that. And so, you know, we, we, we can do that. We can play that. But what? It's the Holy Spirit that does the work. And when the Holy Spirit does the work, it's great, right? And so here's that picture. Hey, hey, give me your oil. Give me your Holy Spirit. No, not so. You can't do that, right? And and so what happens? Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And what happened? They that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. You guys remember another place that that phrase is used? The door was shut, Noah and the flood. Right? You remember that? You know, there they are, uh, Noah's building away, Shem, Ham, and Japheth along with him, and pounding away, building this ark. What do you guys do? You guys are crazy. 120 years, right? And, uh, and finally God says, okay, all aboard. All eight aboard, right? And, uh, and, and then all of a sudden the, the, the waters descend, waters rise, and the Bible says, and God shut the door. And there's a picture there, I believe, just an incredible picture of uh, uh, kind of, if you will, a, a, a visual reminder that that's what's going to be happening in hell. Get me out of here. Right? You see a little bit of that in the rich man and Lazarus. Right? Just cool my tongue. Please. You know? And here they are pounding on the ark. Let me in. No, why? God shut the door. And, and this is the same thing. What, what happens? The door was shut. Right? So, so what? Afterward, here, here come also the other virgins saying, Lord, oh, oh, open to us. Right? And, and it's not, you know, there, it, it's, you know, we, we not making this um, salvific in the sense that they're actually calling out to the Lord. You know, because the Lord will save whosoever shall call on his name. You know, he will save them. So, again, we don't make everything, this say everything. Uh, but he said, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I don't know you. You know? Um, now, now, again, granted, you sit there and you say, Hey, we're the, we're the five foolish virgins, right? Remember, you're, you're the one who was speaking about us. And we, we went to go and buy some, some oil so that we can come and continue with the procession. But what? The procession's over. Marriage is taking place. The door to the banquet is, is, is closed and uh, to, to the, the entire festival, it's closed. You, you can't get in now. But wait, we're, we're part of the procession, right? And how many people, can we think back to Matthew chapter 7 in this context? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, Right? That's why I believe that this is teaching. Now, now some do not take this. I, I believe that this is teaching the difference between those who are truly saved and those who are not. And, um, and so here's five that are saved, five that are not. And, and what? He says, I don't know you. I know you not. And so as we look at this, we, we understand that Jesus is teaching these disciples something vitally important. And in your blanks here, the wise virgins declare plainly that they will not sacrifice their opportunity 
to be in the procession because the foolish ones did not make adequate preparation. Right? And there are so many times that Jesus uh, speaks about those who make excuses. Those who say things and thinking that, well, wait, hey, I had to go to the store and go and buy some more. No, what you should have done has been adequately prepared like the others, right? And, uh, and so we can learn from this how uh, important it is for us. You know, when, when you think of, of the church at Ephesus and profound church, but finally, um, you know, we come to, uh, to Revelation and it teaches us something about this church that was just only 30 plus years old. By the time John writes the revelation and he writes the condemnation that what you have left your first love. You know, and, um, you know, is, is, could that be true? E even of, of people who profess to be saved. You know, what, what's happened? Where, you know, the Lord knows who are his. Right, that we're we're going to see that uh, next week as we we close out this, but but we have to learn that that we all have to be ready, and there's several ways that we can be ready. First of all, we're ready by being truly born again, right? We we're we're ready, and and I'm preaching to a Wednesday night crowd, and I, I get that, I understand that, but but secondly, we are ready by way of our service, right? We're we're ready, we're prepared by way of serving. Right and learning and understanding the the reality that what our 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 lamps are trimmed we're ready we're we're on the go, you know if if the bridegroom shows up we're ready to to proceed on, we're ready to lead them, right we're we're fully prepared and we, we have uh, we have the the proper responsibilities already in play. We thirdly are ready by being good witnesses for Christ. All right, we're ready by being good witnesses. You know, we, we've been faithful witnesses for Christ throughout our lives, having, having had a, a passion for the things of God, right? And, and understanding that we, we haven't lost our focus, if you will, right? We, we've stayed, right? Virgins, you have a responsibility. Your responsibility is what? Be ready whenever the bridegroom comes. Have your lamps already. All ten of them, what? They slumbered and they slept. All ten of them. It wasn't the fact that, hey, the, the, the wise virgin stayed awake. No, that's not it. They, they, they got their rest. They, they slumbered. They were worn out. They were tired. They, they slept just like the others. There's no excuse for that. Right? And, and how true it is for us as believers in Christ to be ready uh, from uh, or for the Lord in his return. And then we're ready by way of living righteously or purely. Right? When the bridegroom shows up, are we living in that state of, of purity? And again, I think that there's something here about these virgins, uh, you, you know, in, in the... the the realm of, of being pure and everything, you know, but again, I don't want to take it, take it too far. And so when we think about this, we then look at verse number 13 and he says, you know, to them, watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the son of man cometh. Right? None of us know, right? But what? We can all be ready. And so we can all watch. This is an important word that, uh, that, that uh, Jesus would use. He would even use that with, with his disciples on numerous occasions where he would teach them to what? Watch. Be watchful, right? The apostle Peter then would pick up on this and use this in his teaching when he would teach us to watch, right? Be sober, be vigilant, right? Always ready, Right, always understanding that not only what is going to happen when Jesus returns, but also be ready, and be watchful, uh, because there there's an adversary out there. And so, as we look at this and we think about this, uh, we need to be what adequately prepared for the Lord's return. Why? Because none of us know the day nor the hour when He comes. And so, what be ready be adequately 
prepared. And this parable reminds us or gives us a convicting reminder of how important it is for people to, to come to Christ when they're invited, right? Don't delay it, right? Not, oh, I'll, I'll do it when, when I'm ready. No, no, no. Hey, always be ready. And that is the admonition that God gives us, not only to be ready by way of salvation, but be ready by way of sanctification, living a life holy and pleasing to the Lord. What a great parable. Well, that's the parable of the ten virgins. Next week, we'll be looking at the parable of the talents and then the parable of the sheep and goats. Those will go a little quicker because we've had similar parables like them. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for uh, Lord, what we can learn, what we can glean, what we can understand, Lord, through these parables. And Lord, sometimes we, we may get lost in the story of it, but, but Lord, there's a teaching, there's a truth, Lord, that we can claim, that we can hold on to. And Lord, here we, we look at this parable of these ten virgins, Lord, five wise and five foolish. Lord, we, we're so thankful for, uh, Lord, what it is to be a true wise virgin one who has accepted Christ as our Savior and now are, are living a life in light of that. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll help us, Lord. Uh, Lord, especially when we think of the Lord's return, we don't know when. We don't know when. He can come even tonight. And, Lord, as the Apostle John would pray, even so come, Lord Jesus. Lord, we're ready. And I uh, pray that you'll help us, Lord, to even be... Um, a testimony to other believers of how it is to be ready for the Lord's return. God, we thank you for that, and we look forward to when Jesus returns. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.